people I know, her devotion to this movement, her devotion to the rights of women, her devotion to making this a better planet is unparalleled. And uh, with that, Beth, come on. I, I've been hugging everybody, ma'am. Yay. <laughs> Beth Presswood, thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. morning. How are you doing? Uh, 10.30, that's an okay time. Um, you know, to wake up, get over the hangover, get your coffee. I'm glad I didn't talk any earlier. So my name is Beth Presswood, as Jamila said. Uh, my talk is on the closet, coming out, and the consequences. And it's basically my personal coming out story with a few tips for other people in these situations. So. This talk is for closeted atheists with hardcore religious families. If your family's just nominal Christian or non-religious, you know, this may not be applicable to you and that's fine. Also, if your family is don't ask, don't tell, it's not gonna be applicable to you. This is for people who have to come out. People that must keep playing a role in order to be accepted by their family. And, of course, people who just want to know about being a hardcore Southern Baptist and coming out to your family. So, we'll begin with my story. This is my family here at Christmas. Uh, my grandmother, granddaughter, um, my mom and dad in the back, aunts, uncles, cousin, other uncle, gramps, everybody. You don't need to know these people. You don't care, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> But this is my family, and um, we were extremely close-knit. You know, we took a picture every Christmas like this. We were together. We lived all within a mile of each other, and we saw each other constantly, you know, every couple days, and that all went away. So I grew up in Cleveland, Tennessee, which is not in the Bible Belt, not in the buckle of the Bible Belt. It's the little prong in the buckle of the Bible Belt. <laughs> there is an entire denomination called the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. And they have that designation, designation because they are crazier than the other churches of God. Uh, snake handling also started in Cleveland, Tennessee just to give you some context there. So on the left is First Baptist Church of Cleveland, Tennessee, which I attended um, basically up until 18, and North Cleveland Church of God, or Church, North Cleveland Baptist Church, uh, which my grand grandparents and aunt went to, and of course I was forced to go to there quite a bit. <laughs> So, this is my early life. Um, it was God-soaked in the prong of the buckle of the Bible Belt of Cleveland, Tennessee. I got saved at age six by reading a chick tract. <laughs> Seriously, those things actually work on six-year-olds. <laughs> I got baptized um, a little bit after at eight. And I've had to do choir, VBS, GAs, whatever, whatever they had. Uh, I had to do it. I even, when I was about 22, my grandmother, um, I think she might have been getting a little suspicious, so she signed me up to go to this thing called Passion 07, which was um, in Atlanta, and it was just thousands and thousands of evangelical young people, and... There was some social justice stuff, which was fairly interesting, but most of it was just don't have sex, love Jesus, and raise your hands and go into a kind of a trance-like state, I suppose. So I was probably not believing in God from my early teens, maybe about 14 on. Um, I always, all my life, really hated church and all the church people um, who were mean and bullies and all they wanted to do was control you. And I, I could see that from a very early age, but I was afraid of hell. Hellfire and damnation 
from reading all those chick tracts, which my mom had every single one, and I read every single one, plus the comic books, multiple times before, um, you know, age eight. So that will scar you, <laughs> Re really. Um, I also read a lot. You know, I read the entire Bible. I found all the very, very weird stuff in it. And, you know, I had questions like, why can't God be in the presence of sin? Because if he can do anything, then he could just forgive our sins and not have us have to be saved and make, every, make people who don't accept Jesus go to hell. But, you know, that would make too much sense. Um, and the goats here in Genesis 30, 25 through 31, there's a story of Jacob and Laban. And Jacob um, made a deal with Laban to get some of Laban's goats if they were speckled or spotted. So Jacob attempted to make more spotted and speckled goats by having the goats look at speckled or spotted sticks while they mated. <laughs> so I was a little kid and I loved genetics. I loved filling out the little Punnett squares at, in biology class and it was just so much fun. And I knew that that was not how that worked. <laughs> so I bring up this story, and it's not like, you know, a giant feature in my deconversion, but it was just one little nagging thing. I mean, I rationalized, and I'm like, well, God just made it work out for Jacob. And didn't think about it too much until later, when it was just a building up of all these ideas of, the Bible really shouldn't be taken literally, if at all. So while I didn't believe in God and I didn't like Christianity and I had you know, a lot of issues with it, I was ambivalent about the A word, the A bomb. Um, and that changed after in college, I listened to the atheist experience and the nonprofits. <laughs> And then I was like, well, damn it, I'm an atheist. And I started the Atheist and Free Thought Club of ETSU, East Tennessee State University in Johnson City. And um, I had a blog called Atheist Girls. I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed by what's on it. I don't put anything else on it anymore. But, you know, it was my, it was my transitional period, and um, I was very happy. And, Everything's going great, and I emailed the Atheist Experience to say, oh, I love your show. It made me come out as an atheist, um, at least to myself and others at school, and I've got this blog and this club, and, you know, just started corresponding with Matt Dillahunty. I also um, made a prank call, which he was not aware of, but Russell Glasser was, and... Um, you may have seen it, it's Eve, the banana clip. Um, yeah, you can go Google that, but sorry, it's a fake call, and I know we really hate fake calls now, but they weren't as big a deal back then as they are now. So, the outing. Dun, dun, dun. So, my burgeoning relationship with Matt was the source of my outing. I um, made a couple trips to Austin under the guise of um, biology conferences. And, you know, that's where I tell my parents I was at. And um, I'd come and visit, and I had security measures. And one day, I let my security measures slip, and someone took a picture, and they put it online with my full name, Beth Presswood. It was uh, one of these series of pictures from the Godless Pub Crawl in Austin. So, my grandmother and my aunt were Googling my cousin who had been in the newspaper for something. And then it's like, hey, let's just Google people. This is fun. And so they Googled me and they found these pictures. So it was um, April. 2009, and I got a call very, very late that night from Grandot. Um, Beth, I saw some pictures on the internet today that deeply disturbed me. What pictures? I think you know what pictures. 
At that point, I played a little dumb because there was a very slight possibility it could have been other sorts of deeply disturbing pictures, but, you know, I don't know. No, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Are you an atheist? Uh, yes. At this point, she just, oh my, broke into tears, her voice breaking, wild accusations about, I knew you shouldn't have gone off to college. <laughs> and I knew, I knew those friends, those friends are influencing you, and I just, I just don't know what you've gotten yourself into. And um, she went on like that for a while, and I basically had to hang up on her. I had to go give a test as a graduate student, um, a teaching assistant the next day. And she's like, she said that she had already called my dad, who I called Utter, and um, told him, that, but then she was like, well, you better call him too. So I called Dutter, and I said, I don't believe in God. And he sort of tried to do some half-assed apologetics like, well, how horrible it would be to just die and have no afterlife. He says, so you don't believe you have a soul? No. He's like, he's like well, I have a soul, and I want to see you in heaven. And he said he would killed my mother, that I had killed my mother um, by doing this. And she was in the background just breaking down, sobbing, in tears. I could hear her. Um, she is actually deaf, by the way, so I really appreciate the interpretation we have here. So over the next few days, I took numerous calls from pretty much everyone in my entire family, aunt, cousin, uncle, um, even the black sheep uncle who does believe in God and has turned super Christian now, but gave me a, a little bit of support there at the first. Um, apparently, there was an emergency family meeting that was held. I, I got a little information about this. They did more Googling and investigation of me and Matt, especially Matt. Um, a few things were said at this meeting. The, do you know what the only thing that would have been worse than bringing Matt home would be? Yes. The only thing uh, worse would be a black guy. Um, even being a lesbian would have been better. So, you know, if there are any black lesbian atheists uh, who want to go back home with me and uh, stir that pot, there you go. Um, Grandot also said that it would have been better for me to be paralyzed or mentally disabled, which she actually used the other word for that, then that's better than being an atheist. She'd, she would rather me be sweet and mentally disabled than smart and arrogant, which uh, being an atheist is arrogant, don't you know? Um, Grand Dot tried to watch the atheist experience and had to go throw up because of all the demonic energy. Um, my Aunt Shree lied to the family and told them that I had an STD, which was just not even true. Um, and in the calls I took from my Aunt Shree, she would not refer to Matt as a person or as a boyfriend. All she would say was, that man who gives you sexual pleasure. Yeah, we'll, we'll get back to their certain sex obsession in a minute. Um, they also diagnosed me with several disorders, uh, including bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, OCD, and autism, because I'm an atheist. Um, my aunt also lied and said that she had called Matt's parents, which, why would you call a 40-year-old man's parents, I don't know, but um, she lied about that. She al they also lied that I did not invite them to the wedding when I had. 
So that all happened um, during the emergency family meeting and various things after. So the next weekend after Grandot had called me on that Thursday night was Easter. And I was planning to go home. And I did go home. I was forced into um, sort of an intervention-like experience with both Grandot and Shree, and where I had to defend myself, defend evolution and the Big Bang and you know stuff that wasn't even on the radar. Um, and they were obsessed about asking me about sex, 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 sex. Like, they were convinced that, you know, I'd been having sex with 10 men at a time, which I don't even know how that's possible, and I've seen some crazy stuff. Um, <laughs> um, so, but yeah, that Easter was very, very, very awkward. And over the months and years after the outing, I had to deal with uh, just sort of abusive calls, um, being told all sorts of things in person, and then later, my great-grandmother died while Matt happened to be in town, and they threatened to arrest him if he came to the funeral. They've never met him, um, Granddaughter and Shree and all those, and it doesn't matter because he turned me away from God, which isn't even true. So I don't know how I'm doing on time. I have a few emails to show, and I have not changed anything in these emails, and... I'll just put them up there for a few examples. Did my stuff go away? Okay, so they love me, um, but then they send verses, blessings of those who have not seen and yet believed. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. So they're praying that God's going to open my mind and I'm going to believe again one day. And tons of people have prophesied over Matt that his eyes will be opened and he's going to believe again one day. We'll see about that. Um, yeah, all this guilt about she's going to bed at night worrying about me going to hell and praying and... Oh, and this is a picture of us at some giant cross they have in Texas with the stations of the cross around it, which is very, very strange. I hope you will come back before consequences happen. I don't know what those are supposed to be. I'm living a great life, so. Oh, and then um, cussing on Facebook, because that's apparently one of their big triggers. And this is the last email um, before the email I'm going to show you. Uh, we love you, life is short, we're gonna die, blah, blah, blah. Um, even Denny has found a good Christian girl. That's, that was my black sheep uncle. So this is what I sent her back after she had not even acknowledged the fact I got married. Um, she sent me a birthday card, but not a wedding card, even though they're, they're the same day. I'm not interested in your passive-aggressive nonsense. You refuse to show any actual interest in me, my life, my wedding, my husband, or do anything beyond sending me notes that just demonstrate your perverted sense of love. I'm proud of my parents, too. I'm proud that they actually maintain an interest in my life and a relationship with me. I'm proud that they're the kind of people who value a good relationship with their daughter over a difference of opinion about religion. I'm not interested in your conditional love, respect, or pride. If you'd like a real relationship, I'd like that, but your behavior doesn't show that. Every letter from you is the same, and until they change, I won't be responding. And this is what she sent back. You can't stop me from loving you. I won't ever bother you anymore. And if you ever change your mind, will be always be here waiting to love you. So her love is conditional, and that's that. So today I have no communication with um, my grandmother, my aunts, uncles, cousins, um, my parents, except me and Matt with 
just a minimum of proselytizing. Matt's parents are great. I love them because they, they've gotten over most of that problem, and they love, they love me. And it gets better. I have a great life now. I'm speaking to y'all, and I have great friends and a great supportive atheist community. So it ended up all right. All right, so just a few tips and tricks, I guess, learning from my story. Do you have to come out? For a lot of people, it, the answer might be no. You know, you might have don't ask, don't tell. Your parents are only nominal Christians. They know you don't go to church. It's, it's all right. But there are people, my dad would call me and ask me about church every week. So, did you go to church? Yes. Well, what did they talk about? Uh, Jesus? <laughs> um, no, they actually had their sermon series online, so I could at least get the title and like the outline notes so I could, you know, say something. But um, will your sins find you out? The online world is just a big place where people can Google everything you do. So if you are going to try to be an out atheist, go to meetings, go to AA, um, everything like that, you're gonna be found out. So you either, you need to have a plan in place for when that happens, if you know it's going to be a big deal. And the big thing is, are you having to actively lie? Because that's gonna get old eventually. I kept it up for years and years and years, and I probably should have come out sooner. And almost everybody, you know, Greta Christina has a great book. Y'all can buy it. Please do. Um, we've, we've spoken about a lot of these things. And there's even that story about me having to lie to my dad all the time is in, in her book. But actively lying is going to get old. And how long are you going to keep that up? You know, do you want to, if you're a young person, are you going to marry an atheist? Um, how are you going to raise your kids? You're not going to be able to hide this and live a life. So, if you're going to remain closeted for whatever amount of time you feel that it's necessary, you need to be prepared that if you do anything, it could blow up in your face. So, you know, if you have a Facebook, you don't have it under your own name. Don't have a shared computer, password protect everything. You know, if you're out in a gathering, don't let anybody take pictures, but know that people do and you could get recognized. And how long are you gonna be able to stand going to church every Sunday if in fact that's what you're having to do? So these are questions everybody has to ask themselves and only you know what the answers are. So, if you're going to come out, when are you gonna do it? I would recommend not when you're financially dependent which means you may not be able to do much atheist activism at all if you're financially dependent, before you have an atheist boyfriend or girlfriend. I cannot stress this enough, that if you come out in tandem with your parents meeting your atheist boyfriend or girlfriend, they're, they're going to be blamed. And it, I have dated evidence of me being an atheist from before I met Matt, it doesn't matter. So, just saying. Um, don't ruin Christmas or Easter, if you possibly can, if those are important to your family. And not if somebody's dying, if, if at all possible. You know, if grandma dies without knowing, well, it, it'll be all right. And emotions are too high, you just, you just can't have that. So the consequences of coming out, y'all saw my consequences. It was total family breakdown. Okay, um, apparently I'm missing critical protection, but that's okay, Planned Parenthood's out there. So we, we've all heard horror stories of coming out. Mine was total family breakdown. Damon Fowler's was literally getting kicked out of the house and all, having all his stuff thrown out in the yard. 
and no financial help at all. Here's the, here's the tech guy to help that. And then there are people who, you know, physical violence and abuse can be a reality with coming out. And those people need to stay as closeted as possible until they can get away. All right, so how do you come out and what do you do after you come out? I've often heard from some people that you shouldn't have a big sit down intervention type thing, that you shouldn't make a big deal out of it, that you should come out organically. Well, that might work for some people, but in my family, I knew it was going to be a big deal. And I knew that, you know, I couldn't just say one day on the phone to my dad, oh no, I didn't go to church this week because I'm an atheist or because I don't believe that stuff. I think some people do need to have the sit down because you know that your family is going to think of atheism as something horrible, as something akin to a drug problem, and you're going to have to present it as, I'm an atheist, I'm still the same person, I just don't believe in this anymore, and let them, let them have their fit. All right. um, something from Dan Savage that's really good is the one-year rule in which you come out, you give your family one year to ask all the dumb questions, to have their little tantrums, to have their little fits, and you give them a lot of leeway. But after that one year, you tell them, shape up or I'm not going to see you anymore. Use your presence in their life as leverage to get them to act better and accept you more. And I think that can be a great thing for people. Um, you know, you have, to give, you have to give them their mourning period because to them, you're not the same. To, to them, they've failed as a parent and they've got to get over that. And they've got to accept that this does not mean that you're all of a sudden evil, an evil hell-raising heathen, even if you are. <laughs> and just have a high tolerance for the questions, the freakouts, and the bullshit. And then after that, if they're still toxic, cut them out. You know, maybe cut it down, maybe see them once or twice a year, but not all the time. And as my friend Jen People says, you're only family if you act like family. And, you know, most of my blood relatives don't act like family. So to me, they're not, not anymore. And just a little note about SEX. It's none of your business. Rinse, repeat, repeat, repeat. For my family, this was one of their huge things. Because Christianity and sex, we all know there's a problematic relationship there. And you can read all about that in Sex and God with Daryl Ray. I'm, I'm pimping Daryl Ray here. Um, I like him. But yeah, I just had to say, none of your business, none of your business, none of your business. Do not even throw them anything. I wouldn't even tell them if I was still a virgin or not, even when they knew I wasn't, so. And so it's never gonna be the same, but you will get to a new normal if you don't have to. <laughs> you will get to a new normal if you don't have to cut them out completely. So it gets better and happy coming out. I'm sure all you people are out, but for anybody who hears this talk who isn't. Thank you.